We are the ones to bring good news to Zion. Hosanna, Hosanna. We have come to sing it from the highest mountain. Hosanna, Hosanna. We will shout it out in the streets of Judah. We are not afraid. For the Lord Creator has come as Savior. Praise His holy name. Welcome to this glorious Palm Sunday. We are so excited to get our palm branches out, to sing Hosanna, just as the children of Israel welcomed Jesus Christ into Jerusalem that day. 
Let's welcome the Lord into our hearts. Let's stand together. Get your palm branches out. Here we go.
king, and you and you alone reign. All things exist by the power of your word. All things that have been and are and ever will be. All that is is held together by you and you alone. So we bow low before you and we cry out to you for there is none worthy of our worship and our praise but you. We thank you that you are a God who hears and a God who cares. And Lord, in our church family, there are those that are hurting, those that are sick, marriages that are ill, desperate needs. Lord, you are the great physician. So we turn to you as your children. You've told us to come to you and boldly ask for what we're in need of. And Lord, we need healing. And always help us to be humble enough to ask. Help us to listen to the counsel of your Holy Spirit. And if we need to ask for forgiveness, if we need to apologize, if we need to take that next step that is humble and right, that we would do that so that we may receive your full blessing. And Lord, there's some dear ones that are going through the valley of the shadow of death even this week. And we know that it may be precious in your sight when a saint dies. For us, it is devastating and is lonely and it is hard. But we cry out to you in faith knowing that you, you can hold us. And Lord, I'm praying for those that are grieving even today that you would send your spirit, that you would send other brothers and sisters to come around them and encourage them and to hold them and to know, as you promised, that they will never ever be alone, that you will never leave, and that you will never forsake, and we take you at your word. Lord, I lift up the Easter drama cast. I pray against sickness, against any type of division, any obstacles, so that your word and your story will be proclaimed in a powerful way. Lord, we lift up Andrew and Suzanne Hyde. We thank you that You've called them out of our midst to be our partners in the Philippines, that they proclaim your word, that they teach others to proclaim your word. We thank you that they will be with us for a season. We pray that they be encouraged and refreshed. Lord, I pray that you bless their marriage, their beautiful child, and Lord, that you just continue to give them what they need to serve you. And Lord, we pray for our own hearts, as later in this service, we will take communion together. Help us to be honest, to confess our sins, that we'd enter into this time of fellowship and thanksgiving, remembering what you've done for us and today, till the day that you come back. We love you, Jesus. We adore you in your precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I want to welcome you. Oh, so good. Did you see the little kids with the palm branches? That is the best. There's nothing better than a worship leader that's younger than 10 with a palm branch. Nothing says hallelujah, hosanna like that. Speaking of that, this week, Easter drama. What a powerful opportunity for us to reach out into our community. If there's been a person that the Lord's laid on your heart that you need to invite, I want to encourage you to act on it. Maybe even during this service. There's going to be some time of reflection. Just ask, Lord, is there someone in my life that you'd like me to invite? And just take that word and act upon it. And because of the way that you have been so generous, we can do things like Easter drama. And there is a plethora a big word. There's a plethora of ways that you can help. And it's on the screen in front of you. There are boxes here. There are facilities you can give online. You can give with your phone. Lots and lots of ways you can do that. Thank you so much for partnering with us. It is such a great opportunity to be together. And uh, our dear friend, one of our pastors, Ben Phoebus, is going to come and share the word of God with us today. Let's open our hearts and be ready to receive it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. 
In the beginning chapters of Matthew, Jesus begins his ministry, and he goes around to all the different synagogues and teaches, and Matthew summarizes all of Jesus' teaching with these simple words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. How does it feel to hear those words? Sometimes when I think of those words, I think of the angry person on the street with a bullhorn and a placard, right? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And I want to look down, and I want to use the crosswalk, and go to the other side of the street and go around. I'm like, I agree with you, but I'm a little afraid of you. But when Jesus said these words... Crowds would come. Towns would empty. So many people would come that he would have to get in a boat and push off on the shore because there wasn't even room for him to speak anymore. There was something different. When Jesus said these words, these were an invitation to life. He'd look at the most broken people and say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near and you are welcome. The ones that he was most stern with were those who he thought considered themselves righteous on their own. To them, he said, repent. Look out, for the kingdom of heaven is near. But to everyone, it was an invitation to life. We're going to consider a piece of wisdom from the book of Proverbs this morning. It comes from Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. That's our passage for this morning. Let's read it. There's a way that seems right to a man... But its end is the way to death. There's this way that that seems like it's going to bring us to life. Like, this is what I really want. This is the path to the the meeting of the deepest longings of my heart. There's a way that seems right. But the reality is that what often seems right at first is often the path to death. My wife, Missy, and I have four kids. They're all boys. They're ages six, four, and two, and seven months. I'm so, so blessed. Being a dad is one of the richest parts of my life. I'm so grateful. And being a dad is one of those places that most reveals my need for sanctification. (laughs) It it reveals the brokenness of my heart in some unique ways as well. One of those key ways in my life is my anger. Hey kids, let's get ready for church. Let's get your socks and shoes on. All right, uh, all right, everybody, let's get socks and shoes on. No, laying on the floor, that's, that's not going to help. Oh, drawing on the wall, that, that's not so good. Are you trying to destroy our house? Hey, no hitting your brother. Right. Or my favorite, here's your coat. Oh, you want help putting it on? No, you don't want help. You do want help. No, you don't want help. You do want help. No, you don't want help, right? <laughs> and in that moment, I wish I could only respond with kindness Maybe correction and instruction, but instead I tend to power up. You will not treat me that way. You will obey. You will respect me. And I go to a demand. You will not treat your brother that way. What were you thinking? Rather than this word of instruction, it's this word of condemnation. It just cuts him down, this cutting remark. And what feels like in the moment the path to life, because I want my kids to listen and obey and be respectful. I want them to be kind to each other. It feels like the answer to that is my anger. Anyone relate to that? But when I sit back and reflect, I think of James chapter 1. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. And I think about what it will produce in the years ahead if I'm parenting through my anger rather than increased influence, which is what I want and what I can get in the moment, it will decrease my influence because it will break 
our relationship. It won't lead to respect. It'll lead to resentment. What feels in the moment like the path to life is really the path to death. This is the decision of Adam and Eve in the garden. God created everything good. The very pinnacle of creation, he created Adam and Eve. And he planted a beautiful place for them to live with everything delightful and beautiful and just right. And he said, eat of any of it. Any of it it's all yours. All for you. Except that one tree in the middle of the tree garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But one day as they walk past the tree, they hear the whisper of the serpent. Did God really say? You know what? God, God just knows that in the day that you'll eat of it, you'll be like him. God's actually just holding out on you. God is, doesn't have your best interest in mind. He just wants to restrain you because he knows that this would make you like him. And they look and they pause and they see the tree and the tree is beautiful. Wow, they say, look at how beautiful that tree is. And doesn't that look delicious? And man, if we just eat some, we'll be like God. And so what feels like the path to life, they grab the fruit and they eat it. And in that moment, they experience the shame of their nakedness. And they run and they hide from God and they hide from each other. God comes to walk with them and he says, where are you? They say, we were afraid. What felt like it was going to be the path to life has become the path to death. If I were to put it up here on the screen, none of us would choose the path of death. The choice is pretty clear. God wanted them to have life, to have abundant joy and pleasure. He created everything there that was delightful for them to have. It's all yours. He wanted them to have love and connection, peace, contentment. This was what God offered, and this is what they chose instead. What felt like it was going to bring them life instead brought them death, shame, disconnection, chaos, fear, anxiety. Now, if I were just to have you come up and line up, like, which of these do you want? Which do you want to experience in your life? I don't think we would have anyone in this line. And yet we have a magnetic draw in our heart to believe that what is the path to death is really the path to life. This is part of our brokenness, how we see the world. Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. This is a story that we see over and over all throughout the Bible. David and Bathsheba, King David goes up on his roof and he looks out and he sees Bathsheba and he says to himself, this is the path to life. She is what I want, she is what I desire and this is where life will be found. So he calls and has her brought to him. But when word comes that she's expecting his child, he begins to taste the death of his actions. He has her husband killed. The son that's born to him by Bathsheba will die. Chaos will descend on his family. What felt in the moment like the path to life was really the path to death. How about another example? Solomon. Solomon wrote a whole book on this. Well, Solomon wrote this itself. But the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, maybe this is the path to life. Maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. Maybe it's wisdom. If I learn enough and I'm impressive in my knowledge enough, maybe that's the path to meaning and purpose in life. Maybe if I work hard enough and create beautiful things and accomplish a lot, then I will have meaning and purpose in life. Maybe this is the path. Maybe the path is pleasure. Maybe if I get all the funny people of Israel together and they make me laugh and laugh, maybe that will be life itself. Maybe if I have enough wives or enough gold and possessions, maybe if I have enough power in, in chariots and horses, that may be the path to life. And in the end, he says, meaningless. 
It's all meaningless. It's vanity of vanity. It's like chasing the wind. Solomon had the unique opportunity of being successful in all those things. Most of us think, well, if I finally get there, then it will be life. He got there. He was the wisest. He was the richest. He was the most powerful. And in the end, he found it empty. How about another example? The prodigal son. In the New Testament, Jesus tells us this story. It's a story that he makes up. It's a parable to illustrate the reality of repentance. It's a story of a son who goes to his dad and says, Dad, I want my money now, even though you're not dead yet. And his dad says, okay, here you go, son. And he takes that wealth and he goes to a far country and he spends it on wild living. But when the money runs out and a famine comes, he finds himself starving wishing that he could eat the food that he was feeding to the pigs because he'd taken a job for a farmer. And he says to himself, what if I went back home? Because in my father's house, even the servants have enough to eat. So he goes back home. And when the father sees him coming from a long ways off, the father runs to him. He runs. And as the son says, Father, I don't, even begin, I don't even begin to deserve to be your son, but could I just be a slave in your house? The father says, no, this is a moment for a party. Kill the fattened calf and bring the finest robes for my son who was dead is now alive. I want you to hold that image of the father and hear these words and see the face of Jesus. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. This is God's heart for you. It is an invitation to leave the path of death and to enter the path of life. In Romans chapter 1, Paul describes the path. How do we get onto the path of death? The first thing that we do is we refuse to acknowledge and worship God. Paul says everybody knows there's a God because they've seen what he's made, but we refuse to acknowledge that he is God and to worship him in the way that we should. And instead of worshiping God, we worship and serve created things instead. Ugh. How sad. And then as we worship and serve created things, We descend into this moral confusion. Life is without mooring. God gives us over to the shameful desires to do things that ought never to be done out of an act of worship for our false gods. This is the path to death. Repentance is the exit ramp from the path to death to the path to life. Repent. First, choose to acknowledge and worship God as you should. And then orient all of your life around that relationship with God. It'll put everything else back in order. In 1 John 2.15, John gives us some clear categories for what draws us to worship and serve created things rather than the creator. He, he does it as a reflection of what Eve saw in the tree. She saw that it was beautiful. He says, we're drawn by the lust of our eyes. She saw that it was delicious. He says, we're drawn by the lust of our flesh. That it was desirable to make one wise. He says, we're, we're drawn by the pride of our hearts, the pride of life. So for these three categories, I've summarized them with three words. Pleasure, possessions, position. It's these things that will draw our hearts to the love of the world instead of the love of God. But the tricky part is that God wanted us to have all these things. In the garden, he created the greatest pleasures. It was a place of delight. He said, you can have it all. It's all yours to enjoy. And I'll make you in my likeness. You can represent me on the earth. I give you dominion over everything on the earth. Honored. So the trick now is to discern. When am I worshiping the things created? Or when am I just enjoying them as good gifts from God? 
Maybe in your life you look at pleasure and you can think of this distinct thing that takes you way down the path of death. And you know it. it. As soon as I say it, you know what you're tied to. You know what you're addicted to. You know what is pulling you away from God, away from loving, loving other people, and is drawing you down the path of death. Or maybe it's just the simple things of life and you don't even notice. Maybe it's just a little me time at the end of the night. I love, once the boys are down, some mint chocolate chip and the next episode of Alone. Am I enjoying a good gift from God or am I allowing something to draw me away from God? It could be either, right? I could do the same action with a different heart in two different ways. Is it life is in the stake at Ruth's Chris? Life is in my next vacation. Life is in a good round of golf. Or my possessions. We are to receive every good thing as a gift from God. But sometimes we look to the thing itself and worship it instead of God. Is it my house? Missy and I are building a house up here in Rockford right now. And it's been easy for us to fall into thinking that it is the path to life. It's the answer. We say things like, at the new house, the kids aren't going to fight anymore. I don't know why that's funny to you. <laughs> My house, it's the path to life. But if the house becomes the path to life and then the mortgage is a little heavy or I built it on an old dump and the toxic fumes come in the basement, like all of a sudden what was the answer to my life could become the path to death. If I begin to worship it rather than to receive it as a gift. My position, I could even turn preaching into a, a moment of the pride of life. Maybe if I do really good, everyone will respect me and say good things to me and about me, right? I could turn a really good, noble thing into an ugly, evil thing. If I get that new position at work, if I take the next step up, then people will respect me. Then I'll be something. Then my life will mean something. Maybe it's if I'm the ideal mom and my kids all behave or my kids make that sport team and perform and I can puff up my chest a little. Maybe if I get enough followers for my vlog on YouTube. Maybe it's just some likes and some hearts on my social media. Position. Well, I elevate myself begin to worship these things as the path to life rather than orient my life around the worship of God. So here's some things that might be helpful in discerning our hearts. First, I, I remember the young man that came to Jesus who was really wealthy. And Jesus said to him, uh, he, well, he said to Jesus, I, wa I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to be your follower. Jesus said, great. Go sell your things, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And I think our things as Americans are so close to our hearts that we're like, man, Jesus, that was a little rough. Like, that's, well, of course he didn't do that. Like, that was a lot to expect. But what should we be saying? He had an invitation to be with the incarnate son of God, God himself on earth. And God said to him, come hang out with me, follow me, be my follower. And the guy said, well, I've got a lot of stuff, so I don't think I can. What would you not surrender for your worship of God? Is it your pleasure, your possession, your position? What would you allow to stand between you and God? What blocks your worship? What will you not surrender to be in relationship with the one true almighty God? Another thing that helps me to discern my heart is gratitude. Will I take these things as good gifts that I enjoy to uh, be an opportunity for me to thank God? 
Do I bring them into relationship with God and under relationship with God so I, I can come to my house and say, God, thank you for providing for me today? Or do these things become a God in themselves? Or do I feel like I've walked so far into the path of death that I can't even bring it up with God? I know this is not a gift from God. I feel dirty and ashamed and like I can't bring it there. That's a place for repentance, the invitation to life. So today I want to talk about three ways to approach or think about repentance. First, enter. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance is the way to enter into the kingdom of God. And some of us here today need to take this moment to enter the kingdom of God, to come into relationship with God, to say, God, you are in charge of my life and I will follow you. I will place my faith in Jesus. The reality is all have sinned. We've all fallen short of what God expects. The wages of our sin is death, not just that moment when our heart beats, but separation from God now and forever. Our sin leads us to the stench of death every moment of our lives. But through faith in Jesus, which we will celebrate this week through Good Friday and Easter, we can be welcomed into relationship with God. God paid for your sin through the death of Jesus and now welcomes you into relationship with him. Maybe today is the day for you to enter. Maybe you already have relationship with God, but you need to return. There's a place in your life where you've stepped off the path, where you've begun to walk down the path of death, where you begin to smell the aroma of death in your life, where you experience the chaos of death in your relationships. You are seeing it bear fruit. Maybe it comes to mind, even in this moment, that one place, the hidden place, the thing you wouldn't want everyone else in here to know about. Today is the day of repentance. It's not a repentance of condemnation. It's a repentance that's an invitation to life. And Jesus will welcome you with open arms and say, thank you for choosing life today. Or maybe nothing comes to mind. There's probably something, but, but you're not aware of it in the moment. Today, as we take time in repentance, maybe it's just a moment to remember. I know in my life, when I recall the feeling of guilt, those deep and bitter and broken places, and I remember some of the things that I've done that dishonored God and brought harm to other people and brought death into my life, I can feel it. And in that moment, I say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your mercy, that you'd rescue me from this path to death. It makes me say, thank you, God. And I'm so humbled by your mercy. And now that I remember the taste of death, I want so much more to taste life instead. It brings us to gratitude and humility and the desire for life as we remember the mercy of God. So today we're going to do something that's a little bit unique in our service. We're going to take five minutes for you to reflect. If you look underneath your chairs, maybe you found it already, there should be a card. If you're online, this is the moment for you to grab your paper and a piece of pen. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't log off. Take the next five minutes to reflect. If this is a moment for you to enter the kingdom of God, maybe what you need to write on that card is, God, you are God. I'm not going to refuse to acknowledge and worship you anymore. I'm going to acknowledge that you are God. Maybe if this is a moment for you to return, you're going to call to mind those places where you need to walk onto the path of life. You're going to write those categories right on that card, and then you're going to write those first steps of reconciliation and repentance on the card. Maybe if this is a moment for you to remember, put down those those names that you would have called yourself without God, those things that would have been true about you. And then over the top, right, forgiven. 
At the end of this time, maybe it's you just stick it in your Bible and you pull it out to remember what God has done for you. Maybe you take this home and you burn this card to say, God, this used to be who I was, but it's not who I am anymore. I accept your forgiveness and now I walk in it. After five minutes, the worship team is going to come back up and we'll celebrate communion together. But take this time to think and reflect. Repent. For the kingdom of God is near.
I see is the battle You see my victory And all I see is the mountain You see a mountain moved And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh battle belongs to you And if you are for me who can be against me For Jesus there's nothing impossible Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You've shined in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. As we were walking back, Peter and Andrew were arguing over who would be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. They're always arguing about who will be the greatest. 
Where's the servant girl? Someone needs to wash our feet. Who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? I am among you as one who serves. Lord, do you wash my feet? What I am doing now, you do not understand. But later you will understand. No, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, then you shall have no part with me. Then, then Lord, not just my feet, but, but my hands and my head as well. <laughs> One who has had a bath needs only to have his feet washed. There. You are clean, though not all of you. As I have washed your feet, so must you wash one another's feet. For a servant is not greater than his master. I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me as it is written. Why would anyone do such a thing? John, ask him who he's talking about. Lord, who would do this unspeakable thing? The one who dips the bread in the bowl with me is the one who will betray me. What you are about to do, do quickly. Where do you think Judas is going? The master must have sent him out to get more food. Or perhaps to give money to the poor for Passover. My friends... I will be with you only a little while longer. Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but later you will follow. Why can I not follow you now? Lord, I am ready to go with you to death. Peter, I tell you, the rooster will not crow on this day until three times you deny that you know me. No, Lord, you know how much I love you. I would never do such a thing. Lord... Please tell us that you're not going to leave us. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to where I am. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. From now on, you know my Father and you have seen him. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Take this and divide it among you. This is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. Take this cup and drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I will not drink of the fruit of this vine again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let my words remain in your hearts. This is my command to you. As I have loved you, so must you love one another. For greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And I do not give as the world gives. So do not be afraid. Let not your hearts be troubled. 
I tell you these things so that in me you will have peace. Be still, my soul. Thy God is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best thy heavenly friend through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome this world. Let us depart to the garden to pray. In you I rest, in you I found my hope, in you I trust. You'll never let me go, I place my life within. It was no accident. It was no accident that Jesus' very last meal was a Passover dinner. It's like we remembered last week together. For all those years from slavery in Egypt, they would remember year by year how God had rescued them. And every year it pointed forward to the one who would rescue us all from sin and death. Jesus is the Passover lamb. So today we're going to celebrate communion together, just as Jesus instructed us to do. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've been baptized in faith to follow him, we invite you to participate with us. I'm going to read Jesus' last words as described by Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, For I received from the Lord... What I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God, we thank you for your rescue. You did not leave us in the path to death, but have invited us to the path to life through the blood of Jesus and faith in him. As we look forward this week to celebrating and remembering Good Friday and Easter, help us to be aware of our own needs, that we might come to you with repentance, gratitude, humility, and hope. 
In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand together and sing a song of testimony. Because we are, we can go in peace. Have a blessed Sabbath.